Alrighty. Since um, April, I've let this sit, and hi, it's me, Vicki. Um, I've let it sit, and it uh, was in the living room for a while, and moved back in here through the last six weeks of studio redesign. Wonder upon wonders, no holes, no kicks in the canvas. But um, this is, it's time to finish it. And I think what I'm going to do is a very light glaze over that to kind of unify it. I uh, will get rid of most of this dark halo around her face, Glory's face. Bailey's, let me show you, what did I do with it? I just had it. There it is in the floor again. Remember my full size print and my tracing. Remember that I moved Bailey's face over just a little bit from from where she was. And that's just about dead on. Maybe just a little bump right there can be eliminated. I'm not after a photorealistic. If you want photorealistic, just take a picture. So that's pretty darn close. And I'm happy with it. So a little bit of linseed oil. This is Gamblin's Cold Press. I'm just going to wet these edges just a little. So my paint will smooth. Right there was where I was going to hit her. So the paint will glide over these areas and I can cover them up. I'm not real sure I like the composition here, but I think I think it may be okay. I've got my computer monitor picture set up over there. As far as skin tones go, I'm fairly pleased. Glory does have a little bit of her olive skin. Bailey has just a little bit of pink. I've got soft lines. I'll get some more soft lines, soft edges. So right now I'm looking at Bailey's ear. It's just barely there. I think that's fine. We're going to leave that. I use this big box of rags. Comes from Sam's Club. Can you see that? Rags. I've got my light set up for painting. Rags. And those are perfect for oil painting because they're a little bit softer. They don't have much lint in them. And you just pull them out of the roll and pull them off. Given to me. Yeah, that's good enough. Good enough for who it's for. You want to, if you've got some characteristics of the uh, blue or the alizarin, that's fine. You want the personality of your individual ink mixes to retain their personality. And the reason for that is, if you mix them within an inch of their lives, you're going to kill them both. You'll get a flat purple color, which is fine if that's what you want. But the Impressionist painters really like the personality of each color. Okay, can you see that? This pile right here is what I just mixed. 
I like the personality of their color coming through. And that gives their paintings a little more life. That's their theory. And it worked for them, so it works for me. I keep the same colors out of my palette all the time. And the reason I do that, this is another inherited pigment. And I've got a paint squeezer, but it's in the drawer. I keep the same pigment out, and I keep, I mean, the same palette, same range of colors out. I've worked with them enough that I know what they, pretty much what they're going to do for me. And um, that way I've got my full palette all the time. Now, since I'm putting things in the freezer, this stuff doesn't dry out. You don't feel like you're wasting it. I still don't paint with enough pigment. actually to my canvas but I do have pigment out this is an experiment I'm gonna see I'm gonna see what it does and I want to thin that down and what am I gonna use I'm going to use just a little bit turp. The other thing that I'm doing, I'm not painting oil every day, so I'm easing into, I'm switching my brain, and I'm easing into the actual finish work on the faces. And don't panic, this is entirely removable. I mix just a little bit of white with the Naples Yellow Light. And what that did was it gave me a very warm, white, whitish, whitish tone with a little warm in it. Does that make sense? I'm wiping a lot of it off. And 
And I went right over Lori's face with it. I'll wipe it back a little bit. And I think I like it. Again, what it did was just put a light glaze over all those colors that made up that background. Is that better? It's good for me, so I guess it'll have to be good for you too. Okay, put the turp up because I'm not used to this setup yet and I don't want to spill anything. I dry clean my brushes. By that I mean I may go through 15 of these shop towel, paper towel rags. They're single ply. They have no pattern in them. And I'll get my brush as clean as I can possibly get it on this towel first. I told you before I never mastered the art of keeping one brush for cools and one brush for warm. Now I'm going to restate my little castle dreamy things over here. Um... Just a little, just little building shapes. Nothing, nothing really in your face. This is, um, this is an imagination painting. Castles in the sky. And, um, I hope it resonates. Smooth that out just a little. Now I want a little bit. A little bit of a loser and I'm kind of mixing it in some of that um, Naples yellow. Kind of making some spires, some, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing in your face. I want this to look like surf or resemble the beach. And it looks like it's falling over. A sea wall. Dabbed a little bit of turpentine in that so that I could get some drippies. Had some early in the painting over here when I was doing my real thin layers. And I want some more now to kind of tie that together. If it starts to look too much like bird poop, just 
take your towel and wipe it back a little bit. This is a little bit of Schmincke's, Schmincke's um, Mango and Cola and Blue. It's a factory admixture of manganese blue and ceruleum blue. And I want to put a little more water illusion in there. So that land mass starts to come alive a little bit. It's a beautiful color. And what makes the makes this particular schminka nice is that it has a little bit of a resin mixed in it, which helps with drying time. Scumble it a little bit just to blend it. And I see a little bit, a little touch, little touch of the mud color, which is the half alizarin, half um, ultramarine blue, and just barely, barely put some hints of window shapes. Okay. Got some good vertical lines, some good horizontal lines going on. Um, it kind of looks like a seawall to me, or it's hitting rocks. Now I've tapped into a little bit of the not violet gray, the oh, poop. It's a gambling color. Can't remember the name of it. Anyway, it's the um, it's radiant violet, and then I have violet gray by Holbein. One is a warmish color and one is a coolish color that makes great value changes or temperature value. See I'm getting rid of that strong outline that was on her. Um, now I think I'm going to shut up. I'm going to put my music back in my ear and I will do a voiceover if necessary. So enjoy watching and I'll see you in a little bit. Very tentatively here, I'm uh, reacquainting myself with the features on the girls. I wish I had gone back and put just a little bit of linseed oil on the dry paint so that I would have not gotten such scratchy feeling. But I didn't. And I didn't even think about it until later on.
The side of the nose is a ball, like I spoke about in one of the earlier videos. And I'm just making that where the nose attaches to the face just a hair darker. And I'm uh, modeling the big ball on the tip of the nose and the side ball just a little. Remember I said this is a whole push and pull exercise. So if you put some paint down and it's a little bit darker and it's there's too much of it, then you work your way back into it with a lighter color and you'll end up with just the right amount. This is an adjustable metal cane. I got it because I thought it'd be a great thing to take plain air, but usually if you're on a plain air box, you can use your arm much easier than you can use this. I still want to find an antique wooden cane with just a rounded top on it. If this one slipped off that top bar once in between my two masks, it slipped off 40 times. It was very annoying. It takes a while when you've moved everything in your office and decluttered and put things up and moved things and it takes a while to get back in the swing of where things are where you don't have to think about it. And obviously the cane has uh, is not where I was used to it being. Minor changes at this point. Once you know the drawing is as perfect as you can get it, then you go back in and refine all of those form colors and shadows and blends. In the beginning, you work both of them up to a certain level. You work the drawing, then you work the color. They're both off at that point, but they're both at the same stage of finish. And then you get the drawing where you think it's perfect. You can spend some time on the form and the color without worrying about the drawing. And then you check your drawing again one last time or next to the last time and make any minor edits you see but at this point there won't be anything major or there shouldn't be put a little bit of white highlight on and then wipe most of it off working on the eye socket making sure that it reads as a ball extending out from the face, the cheekbone. Cheekbone and the cheek curve in and the eye socket curves out, or the eyeball. Working with warm and cool colors to make that ball shape realistic is one of the final and I think one of the hardest frontiers in oil painting. 
the temperature of the color. And remember, I can't, I can't use the computer monitor too much for color because the background was painted very loosely and abstractly first. And then I have managed to find two profile shots of the girls, um, both taken different times, different lighting, and put them together to make a pleasing composition. So the color on the monitor is off, to say the least. Adding a little more highlight on that eye socket and then blend it in. And then put some of that shadow from the eye back. Little baby changes now. Adding a little bit of a cool color there to make the, make the muzzle look more three-dimensional. The lip actually curves out a little bit right before the, the actual lip. So to make that look like it's curving in, takes a little bit of a cool color. And again, I'll restate that my cool colors are made with permanent green light. It gives me a grayed down flesh color. I don't use premixed flesh colors. I make mine from <clears throat> cad red light and uh, cad yellow medium white. I had the Naples yellow out on my palette, so I did use a little bit of that. And if the skin is a pinkish color like Bailey's, I'll add a little bit of alizarin crimson, which is my cool red. Making some brush strokes on Glory's face here where they come. I don't take the brush and follow it right along the outline. I take the brush and come perpendicular to the outline. That gives you a little bit of visual interest.
doing the same thing now around Bailey's face, softening that dark color that was a halo. Making sure I have some soft edges and some hard edges. Unless you want someone to look at something or pull their eye, the sharper edges pulls your eye. So does the lightest and darkest colors, or do the lightest or darkest colors. So there's some really dark in that area right there by Bailey's forehead. So that whole area in a circle of about four inches are my darkest tones. Not necessarily my lightest tones because some of that appears in the background. Those marks in the background are so abstracted they're not taking away from the more realistic rendering of the faces. I'm working to soften the edge of the hair. I want it to read as hair and not as shadow because if it were shadow that would mean her forehead was non-existent. So again I push and pull with the darks and the lights. I add a little bit of a lighter Oh, I add some of the flesh tone in the hair. It reads as brown, but it lightens the black hair just enough to look like match the light that's coming in on her face. That also adds to the illusion of hair. Getting in detailed on the irises now, there's such a strong light on both of them that there's a dark shadow that goes across right underneath the eyelashes. Working on Bailey's hairline a little bit now. You want little wisps of the flesh tone going into the hair and little wisps of the hair tone coming down into the skin. It almost creates a half tone effect. It's um, not flesh tone, it's not hair color, but that's what you have to do in order to get the illusion of the hair coming out of the scalp. Then wipe a little back and then go back and do it again. You'll get some halos and hazes of the original and then the later colors you put on. It all adds up to make the whole. Still using a bristle brush. It's a Trakel Golden Tacklin number two. Sometimes when I'm doing this very fine detail work, I'll actually switch to a longer haired watercolor brush. The problem with those is I can go through a a brush like that with a real soft tip in about one painting session. But you talk about some photorealistic blends when you do that and use one of those watercolor brushes because the hairs are so pointed. You can make a mark and dispense some paint and hardly even see where you've been. 
that's fun too. I enjoy that kind of painting a lot. Doing the same thing on Bailey's cheek that I did on Corey's. Putting in more highlights and then blending them back into the skin tone that's already there. And I think I remember telling you in a previous video that I had my friend Susan take the picture of Bailey in a late afternoon east facing window. So I didn't want sun on her face, I just wanted the light. And I forgot that Susan always has a light on over her sink that casts yellow light. So that secondary light is what you see in the monitor around her lower jaw and her neck. And I don't want that in this picture, in this painting. Here I'm uh, working on blending Bailey's chin a little bit into Glory's face. Again, attempting to make it look like they're in the same painting, or in the same photograph. We're nearing the end on this. I could work on it another 20 sessions. But I'm not going to. I'm happy. <laughs> 